It's a pleasure to introduce to you Dan Mahoney. Uh, Dan Mahoney holds the Augustine Chair in Distinguished Scholarship at Assumption College, where he has taught since 1986. He's a very, a very old friend of mine as well. Um, it would be a, a true understatement to, to, to say simply, as is written here, that he's a specialist in French political philosophy, anti-totalitarian thought, and the intersection of religion and politics. Um, he's the chief introducer of French political philosophy um, to the United States, I think, uh, over the last 30 or 40 years, um, and uh, has been a leading figure in Soltz and Eaton scholarship as well. Uh, by my most recent count, uh, Dan has written over 200 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, translations, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he's in every way a definitive figure in this field. Uh, his books include The Liberal Political Science of Raymond Aron, uh, De Gaulle, Statesmanship, Grandeur, and Modern Democracy, The Conservative Foundations of the Liberal Order, uh, in 2014, The Other Solzhenitsyn, Telling the Truth About a Misunderstood Writer and Thinker. Um, and uh, in between writing all these things, he also manages to be the executive editor of uh, the journal Perspectives on Political Science and a book review editor of Society. Uh, in 1999, he was awarded the Prix Raymond Aron as well. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Dan Mahoney. Thank you very much, Gladden. I keep busy. Um, anyway, it's a delight to be here. It's been an extremely enjoyable event, and it's so encouraging to see so many thoughtful and spirited and uh, hopeful uh, people, given the state of the world and the church, and uh, especially young people who uh, you know, offer a promise of uh, cultural renewal. Let me just tell you a little bit before I start with my paper. I've, been, I've written several pieces for the Solzhenitsyn Centennial. This piece is an effort to get to the core of Solzhenitsyn's moral vision. And I thought a long time about the best way of approaching this. And I finally sort of came up with six or seven quotations from Solzhenitsyn that I thought go to the very heart of his abiding concerns, his spiritual, cultural, and political vision. And so um, my remarks today will be a, a series, will consist of a series of brief commentaries on Solzhenitsyn that I think go to the heart of his legacy and uh, witness and enduring concerns. And my paper is entitled, From the Ideological Lie to Freedom as Self-Restriction. How fitting it is to pay tribute to Alexander Solzhenitsyn on the 100th anniversary of his birth. He is undoubtedly one of the great souls of this or any age. In the words of his famous memoir, he is the pugnacious uh, uh, calf who budded and tried to fell the totalitarian oak, which was the Soviet state. I'm referring to the oak and the calf, Solzhenitsyn's memoir of the years 1960 to 74, culminating in his forcible exile to the West. As the distinguished Franco-Swiss Solzhenitsyn scholar Georges Niva has put it, Solzhenitsyn is at, uh, was at once a writer and a fighter, one who fought evil with cunning and tenacity while chronicling the totalitarian assault on the human spirit and reflecting deeply on what it means to be a human being. He was at once a gifted writer. By the way, I, somebody just mentioned the previous panel. I think the literary contribution of Solzhenitsyn is often understated. Um, a moral witness to those who perished at the hands of an inhuman ideology, a historian, at least a historian by default, um, of the, of the Revol Russian Revolution and the Soviet tragedy more broadly, 
and a philosopher in the informal and capacious Russian sense of the term, who never lost sight of the enduring drama of good and evil in the human soul. He is often misunderstood, his thought caricatured, and his measured approach to politics in the human soul distorted beyond recognition. I have responded elsewhere to many of these systematic misrepresentations that, alas, are repeated with alarming regularity and with a kind of willful ignorance mixed with malice. In this piece, I will take the high road, commenting on seven or eight, six or seven particularly suggestive passages in Solzhenitsyn's work that get to the heart of his remarkable capacity to illumine the truth of things. My hope is that these brief commentaries will lead new and old readers of Solzhenitsyn alike to reflect once again on his person and writings on this, the centennial of his birth. It is my deep conviction that Solzhenitsyn's wisdom will endure and will inspire countless generations of readers. He should not be hastily reduced to a mere chronicler. By the way, it's very important to be a mere chronicler of totalitarianism, of this monstrous but passing ideology, communism, that is of little or no interest to those who live in a post-ideological age. Of course, it ought to be, for reasons I'll explain. But the proof of the pudding, uh, the proof, uh, of course, is in the pudding. So my next section is entitled, The Soul of Man Under Ideological Despotism. I have previously described Solzhenitsyn as a, quote, phenomenologist of ideological despotism. At first, this may seem unduly obscure or abstract. What I mean to suggest is, better than anyone before or after him, Solzhenitsyn has described concretely, precisely, and with the lucidity of a great writer, the effects of ideological despotism on the bodies and souls of human beings. In the Gulag Archipelago, the Russian writer speaks evocatively of the soul and barbed wire. It's the fourth of the seven parts of the Gulag Archipelago. His great experiment in literary investigation, as he called it, describes not only the terrible and consequential choice faced by the Zeks or prisoners in the Gulag camps, whether to maintain their moral integrity or to survive at any price, at the inevitable price, of course, of the integrity of their souls. Solzhenitsyn also chronicles the profound effects of a system rooted in violence and lies on those who lived in free Soviet society. That is, outside the ubiquitous system of Soviet prisons and camps. Soviet freedom, he says, was an immensely muzzled freedom, one based on the lie and betrayal as forms of existence. A memorable passage from chapter 30 of the 1998 work Russian Collapse, at once dark, eloquent, and succinct, powerfully describes the effects of Leninist Stalinist despotism on the human soul. Solzhenitsyn writes, and this is really a very, very gripping uh, passage that sends up much, sums up much of the spirit and letter of part four of the Gulag Archipelago. And it's part of a larger chapter on the Russian character from the czarist regime to post-communism with, of course, the long 70-year period of communist totalitarianism. The Bolsheviks, for their part, quickly put the Russian character in irons 
and redirected it to their own ends. I will recapitulate briefly. A paralyzing fear spread over the country. A fear not only of arrest, but of any action of the leadership given the total and utter worthlessness of anyone's rights and the inability to escape from arbitrary rule by relocating. That, of course, is a reference to the internal passport system. A network of infor informants saturated the population. Secrecy and distrust permeated the people, so much so that any overt activity was perceived as provocation. How many denunciations there were against one's close relatives or against friends who had fallen under the sword. A total deafening indifference toward those who perished all around. An overwhelming plume of betrayal. It was unavoidable. If you want to survive, lie. If you want to uh, lie and pretend, in place of all the good that was dying away, ingratitude, cruelty, and a thoroughly rude self-centered ambition now rose and established themselves. Now only a great writer could describe the deeply perverse effects of totalitarianism on the human soul with such precision, directness, and moral acuity. A political scientist could not do that. This was no ordinary dictatorship or authoritarian regime. It was something new under the sun, an ideological state that inaugurated the inhuman reign of the lie. By the way, Solzhenitsyn uses that expression more than once, but I think that phrase, inhuman reign of the lie, was first used by uh, Boris Pasternak, even if Solzhenitsyn developed and deepened our understanding of the ideological lie. It forced all but the most courageous to participate in the lie and to betray, betray, or at best remain indifferent to the sufferings of family members, neighbors, and co-workers. It destroyed trust and anything resembling the moral foundations of civic society. Such a political order must be resisted for the sake of the human soul and to prevent the universal triumph of evil. Even worse than the millions who perished between 1918 and 1956, 20 million according to the Black Book of Communism, 35 million according to Alexander Yakovlov's A Century of Violence in Soviet Russia, Yakolov, you know, had been a very prominent communist, eventually a member of the Politburo, began as a kind of Stalinist, became a Soviet ambassador to Canada, later an aide to Gorbachev and an architect of perestroika. And I should say, one of the few people in the Soviet elite who took up Sol Solzhenitsyn's challenge after 1990 to repent for his role in a criminal ideological regime. In any case, the inhuman reign of the lie suffocated souls and made an entire nation complicit in moral and political evil. Statecraft is inevitably soulcraft. And when a political order wars with God and man, it must be manfully resisted. Solzhenitsyn was a self-described partisan of what he called the active struggle against evil. He had immense sympathy for those who refused to submit to Soviet tyranny sitting down. In fact, the entire third volume of the Gulag Archipelago, parts five to seven, is a tribute to those who resisted the regime of the lie from the indomitable souls uh, who attempted to flee the camps. If you've read the Gulag, you'll remember the extremely memorable chapters on Georgie Tenno, the committed escaper. Uh, just 
absolutely compelling chapters about this man who made numerous attempts, nearly successful attempts, to escape camp after camp after camp. Um, to the great camp revolts in Agapastus and Kengir in the early 1950s, so dramatically chronicled by Solzhenitsyn. By the way, if you only make it up to like the soul and barbed wire, then skip ahead to 40 days of Kangir. Solzhenitsyn says, for the first time in modern Russian history, there was self-government. Self-government in a camp which for 40 days in the spring of 1954 had le uh, liberated itself from the Bolshevik yoke. Solzhenitsyn even wrote a uh, play about this, uh, a, a, a movie sc a play screen called uh, The Tanks Know the Truth, which, uh, alas, is only an available in an uh, uh, obscure um, um, academic magazine on Russian and Soviet cinema, but it's uh, waiting to be turned into the great movie that it, uh, that it should be. Also, Solzhenitsyn was the first to write about the protests and insurrection at Novocherkassk in the fall of 1962. You had all those UPI and Le Monde and Guardian reporters in Moscow, and it wasn't until 1976 that anyone had heard about what happened at Novocherkassk in, in 1962. So I think the whole purpose of the third volume of the Gulag is to show that the Russian people did not take this all sitting down, that there was some spirited resistance to totalitarianism and the ideological lie. But of course, these protests were violently subdued by Soviet tanks without the knowledge of the outside world. That is, until the publication of Gulag III. So this striking passage that I read to you from Russian Collapse, a remarkable, succinct summary of part four of the Gulag Archipelago, allows us to almost taste and feel the moral and political abomination that was totalitarianism. So moral indifference is no longer an excuse for anyone in the East or West. And you know the little trick. All the people who are anti-anti-communists or blind to the real nature of totalitarianism say, we don't need to think about this because it's all in the past, as if there are no lessons to be learned from the 70-year-old communist episode. All thinking men and women must know that communism is and will always remain coextensive with the ideological lie, with a regime that built upon the sordid pillars of violence, mendacity, and betrayal of those near and dear to us. My next section is called Good and Evil and the Roots of the Lie. But Solzhenitsyn takes things a step further. The lie, he insists, sometimes he capitalizes it, has a metaphysical or ontological foundation. It is not simply the sum total of falsehoods propagated by a cruel and tyrannical regime. In an interview with a German newspaper in 1993, he contrasts his views about the soul and human nature with those of the 18th uh, century political philosopher uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I am most unlike Rousseau in my views, claiming that humans are good by nature, but corrupted by their environment and circumstances was a grave error. I have always said many times that the line between good and evil is not drawn between governments parties or nations, but to every human heart. A human being is inclined to both good and evil. These revealing, this revealing quotation puts us in mind of two famous passages in the Gulag Archipelago, one in the Blue Caps, the other in the Ascent, where Solzhenitsyn makes clear that his great book is not a political expose 
in any narrow sense of the term. Bolshevism was the preeminent example of ideological Manichaeanism in this or any other time. Its theorists and ideologues, its tyrants and torturers located evil in class enemies who are to be imprisoned or killed with impunity. But Solzhenitsyn famously saw, quote, the line dividing good and evil cutting through every human heart. The camps taught him Socratic self-knowledge, the fact that the drama of good and evil was played out in every human heart, in every human soul. He also came to see the falsehood in all ideological revolutions that mistakenly, monstrously, thought that evil could be expunged once and for all through the systematic imposition of tyranny and terror. Repentance before the creator of all and self-limitation for the sake of the moral health of our souls can allow us to constrict evil without ever hoping to abolish it completely from the world. Solzhenitsyn believed that communism was intrinsically evil, just as Lincoln in the second inaugural address abhorred the intrinsic evil that was chattel slavery. But neither Lincoln nor Solzhenitsyn thought that the abolition of slavery, or in Solzhenitsyn's case, totalitarian despotism, would eliminate evil or cruelty from the world. Both repudiated moral relativism before the grave evils of race-based slavery and totalitarian violence and mendacity while remaining convinced that the drama of good and evil in the human soul will persist, persist until the end of time. Today, the fanatics of political correctness combined relativism and moralism in a new and toxic mix. The more I think about this, by the way, that's the disease of our time. A limitless moralism rooted in a limitless relativism. And there's nobody more moralistic than those who deny any rational or divine foundation for good and evil. They see racism, sexism, and homophobia everywhere and are quick to locate the evildoers of our time, even as they repudiate the traditional moral verities that have informed classical and Christian civilization and have done so much to humanize our civilization. They are a source of great intellectual and moral confusion. At the end of his luminous Templeton Address, it was given in London in 1983, a speech accompanying a prize given in recognition of, quote, progress in religion, bit of a curious locution, Solzhenitsyn reiterates, quote, and I think David Deville read this quote before, this in an earlier session, that the primary key to our being or non-being resides in each individual human heart, in the heart's preference for specific good or evil, unquote. But Solzhenitsyn observes that many in the Western world, too, have succumbed to a version of the lie, believing in an untenable ideology of indefinite moral progress, refusing to despair, which is no better than misplaced confidence in inevitable historical progress. By the way, there's never a note of despair in Solzhenitsyn. The final note in all his writings, including the Gulag Archipelago, is catharsis and hope, which is not optimism, catharsis and hope. Solzhenitsyn reiterates his belief in the free will of human beings and societies, a free will bestowed by the Most High. It must be exercised morally, prudently, and responsibly. 
and he calls on the Western world to, quote, redirect its consciousness in repentance to the creator of all. Freedom, disinterred from justice and conscience, inevitably allows evil to triumph in the world. You remember that uh, very memorable discussion in the 1978 Harvard Address where Solzhenitsyn talks about the tilt of freedom toward evil. You know, when freedom becomes disinterred from a larger uh, moral context. As we shall see, it must be accommodated by repentance, moral self-knowledge of the kind offered in the Gulag Archipelago, and voluntary self-limitation. Remember, voluntary self-limitation, not repression, not coercion, not theocracy. Those things Solzhenitsyn is always falsely and groundlessly accused of. If it is to be conducive of a freedom worthy of human beings. My next section is called, We Are Given Only One Conscience. There is a powerful passage in chapter 60 of In the First Circle. Now, In the, in the First Circle was originally written in the 1950s, but only restored to its original, more fulsome, non-self-censored version in 1968, the same year that Solzhenitsyn finished Gulag. That gets right to the heart of Solzhenitsyn's moral vision. In, uh, in, the, in the passage, the Soviet diplomat in Okenti Volodin, once a faithful Bolshevik, a diplomat, and a self-described Epicurean, has come to see the tawdriness and moral emptiness of a privileged Soviet life. Reading his deceased mother's letters, he discovers a moral universe concerned with truth and ethical imperatives that had never been available to him and that he would have once mocked as his wife continues to do so. Inokenti is about to be arrested for warning the Americans about Soviet nuclear espionage. And that's the difference between the softened first circle and the restored first circle. In the softened first circle, the telephone call, uh, uh, Volodin shares some information about a medical in discovery invention uh, to Western doctors. Uh, here he essentially commits treason to, uh, because he fears what a Soviet regime with the nuclear bomb would mean for the Russian people and for the world. But self-preservation is no longer the highest good for Inokenti. He had once believed, and here I quote from Solzhenitsyn, in the great truth that we are only given one life. Now, isn't that the motto of modernity? Self-preservation, comfortable self-preservation, what Leo Strauss called the joyless quest for joy, <laughs> you know. But quote, now with the new feeling that had ripened in him, he became aware of another law that we are given only one conscience to. A great and memorable line. Conscience, as understood by Inokenti Volodin and the mature Solzhenitsyn, has nothing to do with subjective arbitrariness or personal whims or fleeting feelings. The modern, corrupt, relativistic, subjectivist view of conscience. It, for Solzhenitsyn, as it is for the larger Christian tradition, the moral compass in the human soul that gives us access to an understanding of enduring good and evil. It is our internal portal to what is true and good. Gleb Nurjan, another authorial protagonist in, in the first circle, adamantly denies that justice is a class-conditioned idea as the Marxist Rubin strenuously insists. For Nurjan, justice is nothing less than, I quote, the cornerstone, the foundation of the universe, exclamation point. 
and it directs those who listen to it to moral self-limitation. Solzhenitsyn has no time of day for the moral relativists who insist, and here I'm quoting from his January 1993 address to the New York Arts Club when they awarded him with their medal. Uh, and he said, he has no time of day for the moral relativists who insist, quote, there is no God, there is no truth, the universe is chaotic, all is relative, as he summarizes their position in his 1993 address, oh, what a wonderful title, Playing Upon the Strings of Emptiness. The experience of the soul, one truly open to the call of justice and conscience, points in a much more truthful and salutary direction. Once again, we are obliged to listen to the heart, neither ignoring the power of evil nor refusing the stirrings of goodness in our own souls. On the basis of reason and experience and the Christian faith that he had gradually recovered in the camps, Solzhenitsyn refuses the helpless view that man is forlorn in the universe, unable to distinguish soul-destroying evil from life-affirming goodness. A critic of every form of utopianism, Solzhenitsyn nonetheless never succumbs to nihilism or despair. Hope is always the final word in his work. His is unquestionably a moral universe bestowed to us by a providential God, a just and benevolent creator. My next section is called Freedom and Self-Limitation. One of my favorite quotations in the entire corpus of Solzhenitsyn occurs in his seminal 1973 essay, Repentance and Self-Limitation in the Life of Nations. In this particularly thought-provoking reflection, it originally appeared in the great manifesto that Solzhenitsyn edited and published with a series of Russian co-authors, broadly Christian thinkers, and Mikhail Gursky, a Russian Jewish thinker who was sympathetic to Solzhenitsyn's moral and political vision. That, uh, that uh, volume is called From Under the Rubble. I believe it's out of print, although you can find numerous uh, copies online. But Repentance and self Imitation is available, uh, the complete essay is available in the Solzhenitsyn reader. In this particularly thought-provoking reflection, Solzhenitsyn makes a pers uh, persuasive case that repentance and self-limitation are as relevant to national life, um, excuse me, I lost my place, um, as they are to the lives of individuals attempting to live lives of moral discernment. He knows all the arguments for political realism as well as the tenacious hold that self-interest has on individual souls as well as on people and nations. Nonetheless, he argues reasonably and without undue passion that true freedom is impossible without self-restriction. And let me quote the memorable and relevant passage I had in mind. After the Western ideal of unlimited freedom, after the Marxist concept of freedom as the acceptance of the yoke of necessity, here is the true Christian definition of freedom. Freedom is self-restriction, exclamation point. Restriction of the self for the sake of others. Another exclamation point. Solzhenitsyn passionately repudiates the progressive doctrine. That's, that phrase must appear 400 or 500 times in the Gulag Archipelago. Always ironically, 
the progressive doctrine. This faith in impersonal historical necessity that runs roughshod over human persons worthy of our respect and fellow feeling. He knows that an older West also appealed to freedom as self-restraint. See his praise for the American founders in the 1978 Harvard Address for realizing freedom must be accompanied by constant, quote, religious responsibility, unquote. If Solzhenitsyn has a best regime, it would be one in which political liberty and private property, great goods in themselves, would be accompanied by active efforts to moderate acquisitiveness, hatred, cruelty, and by a freedom that bows before the Most High. Tocqueville has a wonderful expression in the third part of the Ancien Regime and the Revolution. He speaks about liberty under God and the laws. This has nothing to do with indulgence toward political authoritarianism. Solzhenitsyn is a conservative-minded Democrat, as both his 1990 work, Rebuilding Russia, makes clear, as does his insistent praise for grassroots democracy in the Switzerland and New England of his exile years uh, from 1974 to 1994, one repeated in his final interview with Der Spiegel on July 23, 2007. By the way, there's a splendid, splendid section in the first volume of Between Two Millstones about Appenzell, about Solzhenitsyn's participation in the self-government of this conservative Catholic canton in the mountains of Switzerland, and uh, it, really, um, it really shows, I think, Solzhenitsyn's profound admiration for this sort of pre-enlightenment understanding of morally and civically serious Republican self-government. Solzhenitsyn despised cruel and tyrannical ideological revolutions, such as those promoted by Jacobinism in France in the late 18th century and by Bolshevism in the Soviet Union in the 20th century. But in repentance and self-limitation, he dreamed of a moral revolution that would demand courage and sacrifice, but would repudiate violence and cruelty. Its centerpiece would be humane and voluntary self-limitation. Such an order is unthinkable without God's grace and a religious revival in the civilized world, one that respected political liberty as the pediment or foundation of free and decent society. This is the closest Solzhenitsyn, an anti-utopian thinker to the core, comes to being a visionary thinker. And my next, I've got two sections left. My uh, penultimate section, I love saying that word to my students since they have no idea what it means. Uh, <laughs> penultimate. Um, my penultimate section is called Statesmanship and Moderation. Solzhenitsyn does not reduce human life to politics, but he is a partisan of moderate politics against fanaticism and utopianism in every form. Even Solzhenitsyn's profoundest admirers sometimes fail to appreciate the principled moderation at the core of his thought. Moderate, moderation for Solzhenitsyn is tied to voluntary self-limitation and the rejection of ideological politics that succumbs to the illusion that willful men uh, can expunge evil from the human soul and the political world. As every reader of the early volumes of The Red Wheel knows, this is Solzhenitsyn's great multi-volume literary historical work on Russia's fatal descent into revolution and eventual 
Bolshevik tyranny. And I think, as many of you know, the remaining volumes of The Red Wheel are in the process of being published by University of Notre Dame Press. And I think that's a, and by the way, Solzhenitsyn always considered The Red Wheel to be his masterwork, the, uh, the most important work of his life. And he began working on that work in the 1930s when he was still a young Bolshevik. So it's quite, quite striking. Of course, he changed his mind about the meaning of the revolution. But, <laughs> but nonetheless, this is the work that preoccupied him. I think Gulag, which most of us think as the other great work or maybe his greatest work, is, was written much more out of a sense of duty to those who had perished, to the memory of the Zex. And Solzhenitsyn thought when he... He had been diagnosed with cancer, told by his doctors in December 1952 that he had three weeks to live, that uh, the curing of cancer, that reprieve, he saw as a providential intervention. It was all the more reason why he needed to go ahead and tell the full truth about Soviet history, the full truth about the camps, and pay uh, respect and uh, safeguard the memory and the human dignity of the Zeks who were imprisoned and died in the camps. Um, all right, so um, if you read these early volumes of The Red Wheel, you know that Piotr Stolypin was Solzhenitsyn's beau ideal of a statesman. Uh, Solzhenitsyn really single-handedly resurrected Stolypin's status as the greatest Russian statesman of the last several centuries. And I think objectively speaking, he was. Uh, he did, he was imbued with that greatness of which Solzhenitsyn speaks and writes. Um, Stolypin crushed murderous revolutionaries and terrorists who wreaked havoc in Russia after the revolution of 1905, even as he endorsed a rule of law state promoted agrarian reform for industrious peasants. In other words, he gave the peasants the legal authority and the means to leave the mere, the peasant commune, uh, which limited both individual freedom and initiative, but also agricultural productivity. Um, and and Stolypin also made a strenuous effort. This is very much Solzhenitsyn's vision, too to unite tradition and modernity in a way that would bring ordered liberty to the Russian Empire. His political stewardship of Russia, which lasted from 1906 until his assassination by Bogrov, a double agent of the secret police and the revolutionary movement at the Kiev Opera in the fall of 1911, was the last great hope for Russia to avoid calamitous revolution and to enter modernity in continuity with the nation's best traditions. Solzhenitsyn establishes that Stolypin was the equal of a Washington, Lincoln, Bismarck, or to refer to later and perhaps more familiar figures, a Churchill, de Gaulle, or Adenauer. Solzhenitsyn made Stolypin's immense human qualities manifest in August 1914, particularly the long tractate on statesmanship that is chapter 65. Another very powerful chapter is chapter 69, which is about the death scene of Stolypin as he waits desperately for a visit from Emperor Nicholas, who seemingly had other things to do than to meet the man who might have been able to save his country. Uh, in a memorable and eloquent passage in chapter seven of November 1916, Solzhenitsyn summarizes Stolypin's middle line of social development between the purblind reactionaries and time servers in the Tsar's court and the progressives and the nihilists and the revolutionaries one, as I said, that resisted both these purblind reactionaries and nihilistic revolutionaries. In my view, this is one of the best descriptions of the noble statesman's soul ever written. 
Solzhenitsyn writes in a truly profound passage, and I remember being so struck when I first read these words, how deep and discerning, insightful, profound they are, and so imbued with a spirit of classical moderation. Nothing is more difficult than drawing a middle line for social development. The loud mouth, the big fist, the bomb, the prison bars are of no help to you as they are to those at the two extremes. Following the middle line demands the utmost self-control, the most inflexible courage, the most patient calculation, the most precise knowledge. One cannot read a better and more enlightening description of the melding of self-mastery, moderation, and magnanimity at the heart of noble statesmanship. Here, too, Solzhenitsyn is a teacher for citizens and statesmen and all those who aim to avoid inhuman extremes. By the way, I do remember a scene in one of the documentaries that was made about Solzhenitsyn after 2000, and um, it was his first meeting with uh, Putin, and Solzhenitsyn was talking about, um, about Stolypin, and Putin says, we'll, pop, we'll propagandize his ideas. And uh, Solzhenitsyn says, no, 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 it's all in the red wheel. So it's a, it's a, it's a very striking scene. Um, my last brief section is called Russia and the West, which of course is a subject of great contemporary relevance. You notice many of the people who are blind to the nature of an inhuman communist totalitarianism seem to think post-communist Russia is the worst thing in the history of the world. Um, in the present climate of hysteria about Russia, where too many confuse Putin's Russia with an ideological and totalitarian state, which I assure you it is not, and ignore the fact that the Gulag Archipelago is now required reading in Russian high schools, as is Matryana's home, as is one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, let us cite a sixth quotation from Solzhenitsyn that remains of great practical relevance for thinking about both relations between East and West and the future of Russia. In an interview with Daniel Kelman, I believe he's an Austrian novelist, that appeared in Le Figaro and the New York Times in December 2006, Solzhenitsyn stated, and by the way, one can find many similar formulations from his interviews and remarks in the 1990s and 2000s, and the broader sentiment uh, going back to the 1970s. It's certainly omnipresent in between two millstones. The communist dictatorship cried out for sure in immediate resistance. However, I, on multiple occasions, also asked Western countries not to equate Soviet communism with Russia itself and with Russian history. Alas, many camps in the West, political and intellectual camps, draw, drew no such distinction. The policy of the Western powers after the fall of the Soviet dictatorship changed little in terms of rigidity. That is deeply disappointing. Of course, little has changed since that interview in December 2006. Too many in the West, I think this is definitely true in conservative circles, continue to confuse Russia with a neo-Bolshevik state. Although now there's people who say it's a Nazi or fascist state. Uh, there are, by the way, Nazis and fascists in contemporary Russia. Putin just isn't one of them. And there is the red-brown coalition that wants to bring together the worst of fascism with nostalgia for Stalinism. But Putin isn't one of them. Let us listen to Solzhenitsyn. Reject the rigidity of the past and, and, and hope fervently that Russia frees herself more completely from the painful residues of the Soviet past. Because there are many residues of the Soviet past. After 70 years of soul-destroying despotism, 
This was the myth of uh, you know, Anders and these others. They'll come in, they'll liberalize the economy in an hour, and the Soviet Union will be a libertarian paradise run by the Chicago School. Uh, <laughs> this was how blind spiritually blind the Western experts were in the early 1990s. And we applauded a kleptocratic regime still dominated by ex-communists who were stealing ordinary Russians blind as Democrats and capitalists. I'm referring to the Yeltsin era. Um, she, Russia, undoubtedly needs to make much more progress toward ordered liberty. In the meantime, I encourage those of you who heard my remarks today, to spend time with the Solzhenitsyn reader where you can find most of the text that I've referred to today. Um, and there I think one can discover the wisdom of a great writer and a great soul, one who points us to profound and enduring truths about politics, human nature, and the soul. You know, whenever I think and talk about Solzhenitsyn, I think the word that inescapably comes to one's tongue is the soul. You know, uh, the best way to talk about the soul is not through Thomistic metaphysics or De Ana Aristotle's De Anima. It's through a concrete encounter with the human soul in the world. By the way, I'm not anti-metaphysical, don't get me wrong. I don't need any lectures afterwards uh, about the beauties of Aristotelian metaphysics. Uh, but I, I think in literature, in great literature, where the ethical responsibilities of human beings are taken seriously, the soul is vivified. It comes alive. Those words, we not only have one life, we are given only one conscience to. I mean, that could be a guide for any humanly serious, religiously serious, civically serious human life. In conclusion, we honor Solzhenitsyn by allowing him to open our hearts and minds to the great and enduring drama of good and evil in the human heart that is co-extensive with humanity itself. Solzhenitsyn is one of those rare thinkers and writers who humanely points beyond the ideology of indefinite progress, the progressive doctrine, and the nihilistic tendency to despair about the prospects for the human race. In an interview with Joseph Pierce for the first volume of his uh, small Solzhenitsyn biography, Solzhenitsyn called himself a pessimistic optimist, <laughs> pessimistic about the state of current modernity, as he put it, but hopeful at least that God will not abandon us and that the free will of human beings is available to rejuvenate our souls and our civilization. In the end, Solzhenitsyn calls us to responsibly and conscious, conscientiously exercise our free will, guided by the grace and providence of a just and merciful God. That is a true lesson in humanity, wisdom, and moderation. Thank you. I I think for the discussion, I'm going to sit down. So you, you'll still be able to see me. I'm not invisible. And um, um, yes. I'll take questions from over there. I'll come back over, Dan. Okay. No, thanks very much, Dan. That was wonderful. Um, I thought the anti-penultimate section was the most interesting. <laughs> I think you should try that one out. Try that one out on your students. <laughs> right. Well, um, I don't know if we want the mic on the questions or not. We, we do. OK, because we're recording. So. We'll do it uh, TV show style. Um, so first question, Mr. Schenkel. Thank you, Professor Mahoney, for your uh, lecture. Uh, my name is Ryan Schenkel, uh, St. John's College Graduate Institute. My question is, what was Solzhenitsyn's views on any connections between liberal democracy and uh, uh, Soviet communism? 
I'm thinking of a recent book by uh, Mr. Legutko, uh, The Demon in Democracy, that when he observed in Poland, many ex-communists quickly became liberal Democrats. Um, was there something he saw in any parallels between the two? Yeah, no, that's a fine question. Um, don't forget, this will really be the subject of the continuing volumes of the Red Rio, March 1917. Solzhenitsyn had an extremely low opinion of the liberals and socialists who governed Russia. Well, as he puts it in an interview, for minus two days after the uh, February Revolution. But these were men who, for one thing, saw no enemies to the left, who were so filled with hatred for the monarchy and the Tsarist regime that they didn't appreciate that this was not an evil order that needed to be torn to pieces, but it was an order still open to reform, uh, the kind of reform represented by Stalin. So there's no doubt that Solzhenitsyn was very critical of that current of liberal democratic thought that saw no enemies to the left, that believed not in the methods, the coercive and violent methods of the Bolsheviks, but their ultimate emancipatory goals. Uh, if you read Rebuilding Russia, which was um, published in Russia in 1990, and I believe in the United States a year later, Solzhenitsyn endorses democracy, but he does so in a very cautious and even conservative way. It's the only re really available alternative in the contemporary world, but I think it's very clear Solzhenitsyn is critical of democratism or an idolatry of democracy or any understanding that feels, fails to appreciate the pre-modern spiritual and cultural supports that are so necessary for the help of democracy. I guess the last part of an answer would have to be, you know, you're, you, I think what you're talking about is we are all witnessing before us a kind of endless self-radicalization of democracy. You know, what used to be unthinkable, like gay marriage or transgenderism. I mean, I, th I think I was called by a student transphobic, whatever that means, when I suggested that it might not be possible for human beings to change who they are, how they're created. You know, these categories, this, this, um, un this belief in radical willfulness and autonomy, the denial of a uh, sempaternal human nature, the willful denial of a natural moral law of a, or of a providential support for democracy. These are things that used to be essential elements of the real life of American democracy. So I think Solzhenitsyn, you know, if you read the Harvard Address, he saw all of that. He saw that uh, American democracy was no longer guided by that same rich notion of self-limitation and religious responsibility, which, was, which at least had a voice at the table at the time of the American founding. And of course, it's a very rich section in the Harvard Address where Solzhenitsyn talks about why 20th century intellectuals so, uh, display such limitless indulgence toward communist regimes. All of this has been written about at great length by the great sociologist Paul Hollander in a series of books beginning with Political Pilgrims. But Jean Sartre and many others were indefatigable in their enthusiasm for every form of mindless and, uh, and bloody totalitarianism of the left in the 20th century. And I think Solzhenitsyn saw that the common core was anthropocentricity that once one denies the link of democratic self-government to a natural and divine order of things, then, perhaps not, not so paradoxically, communism is a more consistent form of humanism and materialism. The strength of liberal democracy is its incoherence. We don't carry these modernist premises all the way to their logical but now, alas, this is the truth, I think, of Patrick Deneen's book that I otherwise don't wholly agree with, is increasingly our liberal democracy is not a mixed regime building on 
older moral, religious, and cultural and political traditions and the ideology of the rights of man, it's more and more exclusively um, a reflection of anthropocentric humanism. So, not that Solzhenitsyn commented, I mean, I mean, culturally, things have gotten a lot worse since 1978, but Solzhenitsyn provides plenty of insight and analysis for making sense of our situation, if I can put it that way. Why don't we have further questioners come up here, it's just easier. Thank you. I'm Michael Platt. Um, hi, you, Michael. Hi. <laughs> uh, you touched, uh, uh, we know a lot about what Solzhenitsyn thought about communism in Russia, and you've touched upon his thoughts upon what subsequently came. I have a question about China. On the way to uh, conducting a couple of liberty funds, I went to visit Harry Wu. 17, I think, years in the Chinese Lao Gai system. And I said to him, you've read Solzhenitsyn. And he nodded and paused. And I said, comparisons? And he said, Chinese smarter. By which subsequent conversation showed he meant they ideologically constantly. There is no peace and quiet in which to have friendships, which you mentioned, so you need some first enjoying in the gulag, where you could say what you thought. Plus, the production of sophisticated goods under that more oppressive situation. So I'm interested, it occurred to me, that so you need to think about other expressions of totalitarian communism elsewhere, particularly the Chinese, and also did he comment on subsequent events, Tiananmen Square, et cetera? I do remember when Solzhenitsyn gave his great address in the Vendée in uh, the fall of 17, 1973, he, uh, he said it would be wonderful to have representatives of, of China and Vietnam and Cambodia, etc., to share their experience of the mercilessness and the violence of ideological revolution. Um, but yes, I think your broader point about the Chinese camps versus the Soviet camps is true. Um, the Chinese camps were so monstrous because of the systematic emphasis on re-education. You know, for a long time in the West, in the 50s and 60s, we had a social science literature on brainwashing that came out of the experience of American POWs in North Korea between uh, 50 and 53. And I think one of the paradoxes one does discover in reading Solzhenitsyn's works, both the Gulag Archipelago and the great sort of autobiographical works of fiction, is um, in a paradoxical way, there was more room for male friendship, for philosophical conversation, for reflection on the soul in the camps than there was in quote unquote free Soviet society. That's certainly the import I think of the great chapter, Our Muzzled Freedom, where one sees just how suffocated free Soviet life was during the Lenin and Stalin periods. And uh, we don't, by the way, we don't, uh, millions of people died in the camps, people were working Conditions of cold, of work. Uh, there was a dehumanization of the heart of the camps. There was an assault on human dignity. You don't want to romanticize them. But if one reads a chapter like The Ascent in the second volume of the Gulag Archipelago, one does see that it was, you know, Solzhenitsyn had conversations in the camps. And, he, uh, and it was there that the scales of ideology fell from his eyes. And he does make a distinction between prison and camps. The famous remark at the end of the sentence, bless you, prison for having been in my life. The camps were somewhat different. But um, yes, I think, there's a di I think there's a difference there. I don't know, maybe Ignat Solzhenitsyn who's here would know 
I don't remember Solzhenitsyn commenting on post-Maoist China at all or very much. I would say China is sort of a challenge for those of us who are students of modern despotism because they have repudiated central features of communist ideology. The most important sentence in the Communist uh, Manifesto, right in the middle of part two, is communism can be summed up in a single sentence, the abolition of private property. Instead, they've replaced it with a regulated, kleptocratic, quasi-capitalist, quasi-statist system that seems to be producing, although maybe not as much as the official economic statistics of the Chinese regime suggest. But they remain pretty hostile to religion amidst a huge Christian religious revival in China. Their population policies are monstrous. They have a dangerous self-assertion in the world, a lot more self-assertive than Putin's Russia. Uh, and uh, so it is hard to know what to call this regime. They haven't, uh, you know, the trick in 76 was Mao died and uh, and uh, they condemned almost everything he did, but they blamed it on his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mao and the Gang of Four. That was a little trick. <laughs> you know? So there's still a cult of Mao in China and the new Chinese president who seems to desire power for the long run. And he's talking about the need for more ideological purity. So, but I think there's something new in China. It's a, it's a post-totalitarian regime. And, it's, uh, and yet, uh, talking about residues of the Yes, they're very, very influential and powerful. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Cody Cooper. I'm an assistant professor of political science at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. Um, I was Did interested. You say you're a political scientist? Yeah. Where political theorist, uh, Tennessee, Chattanooga. Okay. Um, and the last part of your paper uh, got me interested in connecting back to some, some stuff you talked about with Econ, um, about American-Russian relations and foreign relations. And I was thinking about the post, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, the expansion of NATO into the, the former Eastern Bloc, the, 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 right. into Eastern Europe. And many, you know, many argued that there, there was an argument at that time of maybe bring in Russia too, but that obviously didn't happen. But many argued that this is really, this was seen as a great threat and imprudent to Russia to expand closer and closer to the door of Russia and NATO. And, it, and I was wondering if Solzhenitsyn had ever expressed thoughts on, on that specific he did. act. And if so, you had thoughts on it as well. So, so, Solzhenitsyn spoke quite openly in an interview with Moscow News about Russia being in a circle. And um, he, um, he thought NATO had gone from being an anti-totalitarian organization of Western collective security to an organization that had become openly and aggressively anti-Russian. I had a conversation with Richard Pratt Pipes, who was no fan of Solzhenitsyn's. Although, gloriously, he wrote a nice blurb for March 1, so maybe he reformed in, in old age. But uh, Richard Pipes said to me, this was in 2009, he had been a Approached by the Wall Street Journal to write a article condemning Congress and the Bush administration for not pushing hard enough for Georgian membership in NATO. And Pipes, who was a classic Russophobe, the most generous thing you could say is he had a Polish view of modern Russian history. <laughs> Pipes, Pipes, uh, 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 Pipes said to me, well, I'm not for Georgian membership in NATO. It's provocative. It, um, it, it, it really does suggest an aim to encircle Russia. He said, all the Russians I know, including the most liberal, including the most anti-regime, oppose it. And he said it would be like having a, a Russian troops in Mexico and Canada. This is Richard Pipes, uh, who was no friend of Russia at all, and certainly no friend of Putin's Russia. So uh, look, I think you can make distinctions. Look how modest and moderate the Russian response was to the inclusion of the Baltic states in NATO. I think there's an understanding that there's a historic responsibility. You know, a 
third of these populations were sent to the camps. Terrible injustice. And Solzhenitsyn generally writes with great admiration for the Lithuanians and the Estonians that he met in the camps. So the Baltic states really can't protect themselves. But Ukraine's another matter. It's a 50-50 country. It, um, um, the, the historic Russian state arose in Kiev a millennia ago. Uh, the destinies of families are tied. Crimea was given unilaterally to the Ukraine like an oriental satrap by uh, Khrushchev in 1954. The Crimeans are Russians. The Russians have an important naval base there. All this comes into consideration. And you know, the government of Ukraine was quite nasty, uh, but it was democratically elected. So the Maidan revolution did overthrow an elected government. So um, I just mention all of this. I do think American and Western policy toward Russia Going all the way back to the Yeltsin period has been unduly aggressive, unduly sent. They have proceeded, I think as Solzhenitsyn says, as if nothing fundamental happened with the Polk Congress. And uh, how many times do you hear that Putin was in the KGB? How many times do you hear about the statement that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century? The full statement is, that the Soviet Union was a totalitarian emperor, empire that deserved to go. The context of his remarks was the loss of the Russians in the near abroad, which was a concern of Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn favored independence for all the constituent states of the Soviet Union, but he worried about the third of, uh, of Kazakhs who were Russians. He, he worried about the Russian populations in the Balts, Balkan countries, etc., or, or the Russians in Eastern and he said, why accept these Leninist borders? Why not reconstitute the borders in a more politically and morally sensitive way? So anyway, that's a very long answer, but uh, 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 you look at Solzhenitsyn on the one hand, he says, empire is a disaster for Russia. Let the Balts go. Let the Transcaucasian people go. Let everyone go. On the other hand, he says, don't abandon the 25 million Russians in the abroad as if they don't belong to the great cultural and spiritual Russian nation. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dan Mahoney.